Welcome to everyone to attend this uh, webinar, the second session of Radical Ecologist. I'm very honored to have uh, this uh, brilliant set of uh, panelists and also attendees. Um, actually, we'll simply uh, introduce once again uh, Paula Vigano and each uh, panelist, and then I will leave the floor to Sebastian Mero, which I thank you personally for accepting our invitation, as well as uh, Thomas and uh, Andrew. I will repeat the ones he will come. Hi, Thomas, I can see you. And of course, Paola. Um, for those who didn't attend the previous uh, webinar, uh, Paola Vigano is an architect and urbanism, urbanist, uh, is a professor in urban theory and urban design at APFL Lausanne, where she heads the Lab U and the new Interdisciplinary Habitat Research Center. She is also professor at UAB University of Venice, and guest professor in several international schools. In 2013, she received the Grand Prix de l'Urbanism in France. Uh, the first presentation will be Taking the Countryside from Sebastien Marot, who is a philosopher and historian, teacher at the College d'Architecture de la Ville des Territoires in Paris, and at l'Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne in uh, Switzerland. Um, for the 2019, um, the Lisbon Architecture Triennale, he curated a large exhibition and published a book entitled Taking, Taking the Countryside, Agriculture and Architecture, uh, edited by uh, Polygrapher Barcelona. Uh, the presentation of Sebastian will be followed by um, the presentation of Andrew, which is entitled The Quest of Building a Food Regenerative Ecosystem Integrated with Urban Space and Communities, Learning and Possibilities. Briefly, Andrew is an impact entrepreneur and urban far farmer, following his uh, previous professional roles in both public and private sector. He's also interested in uh, creating projects about uh, circular economy, green tech, resilient, sustainable, smart design. After the Andrew presentation, uh, Thomas Chung uh, will introduce his uh, Toward Regenerative Ecologies in Hong Kong and Shenzhen. Thomas Chung is an associate professor at School of Architecture, Chinese University of Hong Kong. He works in uh, regenerative architecture, uh, uh, reflected internationally in uh, his uh, projects such as Values Farm in 2013 and Floating Field in 2015, that fuse ecological design, productive landscape with socially innovative public space. Uh, Thomas' current research is uh, driven by regenerative uh, design, including topics on countryside conservation, village revitalization, co-creative placemaking, school redesign for well-being. And finally, we will have uh, Paul Zimmerman with his Hong Kong, a city of extremes. Uh, Paul is an elected councillor representing the Pok Fulam constituencies in Hong Kong and CEO of Design Hong Kong, a non-for-profit organization devoted to promoting sustainability, quality of life, and the good design of the core values in planning, development, and governance. There are a few projects about him, with working with wheels, designing Hong Kong Arbor District, and save our country parks. So perhaps Paul will tell us more in his uh, after his presentation. Thank you, everyone, for for coming. And please, Sebastian, be free to to start at your convenience. Okay. So as I understand, um, I have fifteen minutes, right? Yes. Okay. Very good. So uh, can I share a screen? Yes, please. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm just going to say a few words um, about this um, exhibition that we put together um, two years ago um, uh, in Lisbon. Um, it was called Taking the Country's Side. Uh, and I will focus on a little um, aspect of this exhibition, which uh, was in a way its conclusion. Um, so it was a large exhibition um, looking at um, the relationship between uh, agriculture and architecture, but also um, uh, urbanism um, and the city and, and, and country. Um, and it was um, trying to document um, a few significant moments in history uh, where those two, you could say, uh, fields of activities um, um, were articulated. Um, 
and um, the exhibition uh, was also um, including a large, large uh, timeline <laughs> going from the Paleolithic uh, to uh, today, um, um, uh, trying to locate these different um, uh, uh, moments, significant moments that we might want to bear in mind when we look um, at those two disciplines uh, uh, today. Okay. Um, I summed up um, one of the reasons uh, we did this exhibition like that, uh, saying that yes, today any uh, seriously informed uh, uh, individual uh, who takes the pain to document uh, uh, him or herself uh, on, 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 on our situation is, is confronted to a very, very uh, perplexing situation. Because when looking uh, back at the past, it all seems um, as if the urbanization of the world um, is indivisible uh, and is integral uh, to history, right? That it is the... Um, uh, the most probable uh, future, okay. But when you try to probe um, uh, the future, um, especially through the lens of en environmental uh, issues, um, this same um, global urbanization looks um, rather improbable, impossible, and like the end of history. And so the question is, how are we to deal uh, with a situation, situation which is ours that looks both inevitable and impossible? Right. Uh, so our uh, uh, exhibition modestly tried to uh, um, help us a little uh, dealing with such an uncomfortable uh, uh, situation. At the end of the exhibition, um, we proposed a kind of little windrows to reflect on the latent or future relationships between uh, cities and countryside. Um, one, of, one of my uh, great... Um, uh, And, and latest influences uh, on my thought comes from the field of permaculture, and especially from David Holmgren, whom I consider the most articulate um, um, theoretician of that uh, practice, uh, especially in this book uh, of 2002 called Principles and Pathways Beyond uh, sustainability. More, more recently, or six years after, he produced a little book um, that is not uh, very well known, but uh, that I think is extremely um, uh, important, called Future Scenarios. In this book, he simply states that we are now confronted to two um, phenomena simultaneously. One, uh, we could call it uh, oil decline, peak oil. But you could add the peak of very uh, um, uh, important uh, materials also, like metals, rare earth, or things like that, right? So. This, uh, uh, you could say, it's energy and material descent. Whether that descent will be slow or fast, we don't know. So you have in this graph from slow to fast. In a way, this vector is a vector of the diminution of our power to transform the world, right? 
the availability, less availability of energy, of fossil uh, energy, of important materials or things like that. So um, this was uh, David Holmgren and his 2002 so important book, which I strongly uh, recommend. Um, and this is what he explains in this 2008 book, um, uh, Future Scenarios. So you have, you know, on the horizontal line, that vector of energy and material descent. It can be uh, slow uh, on the left or fast uh, on the right, right? And simultaneously, uh, you have the other vector uh, here, which is called global warming. But you could say uh, it's also uh, biodiversity collapse, uh, etc. This is the deterioration of the conditions of life on our planet, right? Which can be benign uh, uh, here or become um, um, uh, very destructive uh, and very fast, right? So the f if, if you consider that we are simultaneously uh, confronted to those two uh, problems, right? And if you cross them like that, then you obtain in each quadrant a different scenario, right? If you are confronted to a slow oil and material decline, but to a very uh, destructive uh, global warming, then Holmgren uh, calls that, that situation brown tech. Brown tech means you're confronted to very powerful uh, states, right? Uh, they still have a lot of power, right? With energy, uh, fossil energy, with all that. Um, uh, and they become super dirigists, right? To try to resist, for instance, uh, uh, sea level uh, rise with huge concrete uh, stuff, etc. Okay. If you are in a situation where you have a slow oil decline and a benign global warming, then you are in a scenario green tech, right? You can use that energy, which is still available and those materials to prepare for them a moment, but you, you, you build wind turbine, you build, <laughs> you prepare for a moment when things will be uh, 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 worse, right? This scenario is the green tech in which uh, maybe all Europe is dreaming uh, uh, to, to be. If you are in a situation where you have still livable global warming, but a fast oil and material decline, right? Which is, you could say, exactly the reverse situation of the one that started the Industrial Revolution, then you can expect, he says, the, a, the, a contrary effect, meaning people leaving city, people uh, going to places where uh, energy uh, uh, very dispersed is still there and must be taken care of, right? So you have an urban exodus. And finally, uh, the worst situation uh, where you have both destructive global warming and fast uh, uh, oil, uh, decline. This uh, is what uh, Holmgren calls um, uh, lifeboats, right? Um, it does, I mean, it, 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 you don't have in that last scenario uh, world wars, for instance, because you, you don't have the energy uh, uh, for that, but you have a, a kind of matrix uh, situations, you know, of living. Holmgren explains that these scenarios are not exclusive from one another, right? Uh, first, because the world is not the same everywhere, right? And you have like a situation uh, that are ready for brown tech. That is, Holmgren thinks that Australia is heading for brown tech because it has a lot of um, um, dense uh, reserves of dense energy and is uh, badly confronted to the consequences of climate change. But New Zealand is another story, et cetera. So, and also because uh, they, they could be like a Russian puppet within, within one uh, another. But all that said, 
uh, Holmgren thinks that the best way to prepare ourselves to any of these evolutions is to uh, prepare for the earth steward, uh, uh, the one where you would deal with energy descent by preparing uh, yourself for that, and that it would be uh, the best way uh, to address uh, uh, the future. So in our exhibition, um, it does not exactly translate this, but I did a little, uh, uh, we did a little exercise um, of proposing a little windrows of the future rela possible relationships between um, cities and uh, countryside. Uh, when we talk about um, the urban agriculture, um, we do not always mean the same thing, right? It can mean very different things. And I wanted to try to distinguish um, um, four different direction that it might take uh, today. The first one I call incorporation. It is the idea that the uh, industrial uh, uh, era is leading to a kind of hyper uh, industrial uh, era um, and that the, the city uh, or cities are going to absorb agriculture or at least become the uh, the control tower right uh, of agriculture in this scenario which is a scenario of concentration uh, this is why i use the term incorporation also um, in the capitalistic sense uh, uh, of that term um, yeah the city absorbs agriculture. Agriculture becomes something that has nothing to do with uh, family business or, or things. It's a super big uh, corporation. Uh, you have buildings that grow food uh, within the, the, the cities and uh, they are the control tower of a territory completely controlled by uh, them. It is the ethos of concentration. Another <clears throat> Um, strategy or vision is the idea yeah, that yes cities will continue to grow to grow um, but more horizontally uh, and will in a way hybridize with programs that were traditionally outside of their realm and particularly agriculture forestry uh, um, uh, etc so agriculture becomes one of the programs of a horizontal metropolis that negotiates you know, uh, its uh, own program with those uh, traditionally uh, uh, of, of food production, of fiber production, of uh, uh, all of this. Um, it's very different from the precedent in the sense that it's not an ethos of concentration. It's uh, the idea of a new hybrid um, a, a kind of urbanization that is more, um, yes, uh, that, it, that integrates or negotiates with uh, food production. Uh, yeah. Another one, which is uh, usually the one that we associate with urban agriculture, at least uh, 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 in um, uh, Western Europe, um, I call infiltration. Here, it's the reverse movement in a way. It's uh, agricultural um, initiatives um, that permeates into the fabric uh, of the city. Uh, rooftops, uh, you know, the sides of roads, um, uh, etc. So, uh, and it's also urbanites that kind of um, uh, establish link with farmers outside the city that provide directly for their food, uh, etc. Right. Okay. Uh, this is usually, um, how do you say, acupunctural, right? Uh, it's not a, 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 a policy, uh, absolutely, but it can be massive. When you think, for instance, of La Habana during the special period, all of a sudden, right? Uh, 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 all um, the vacant lots, etc., in the city were 
uh, put to use for agricultural uh, uh, or horticultural uh, production, etc. Think of Detroit uh, after the fall of the you know um, car economy there. Same, right? Okay, so it can be massive. And finally, there is a last um, possible relationship between the two, which is cities and country, uh, agriculture and architecture, which is the exact reverse of the first one of incorporation. Um, and that corresponds, in a way, uh, to the earth steward scenario of uh, David uh, Holmgren, which I call, I know the word is a bit strong, secession. Secession uh, uh, is uh, <laughs> all these attempts by people who leave the city, or even when they are still in the orbit of the cities, uh, in suburbs uh, like that, uh, organize uh, themselves in a more autonomous uh, way, right? And uh, do a, a, a kind of secession with the modes of governance, even though, uh, of course, they, 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 they have to abide uh, some of their laws, but they uh, 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 dissociate themselves uh, of um, uh, the city, I call it. Uh, secession. Um, so you see, it's a very simple and caricatural uh, uh, little uh, windrose um, meant to help us reflect on what kind of future um, we uh, wish uh, to work for. I'm done. Is it all right now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Yes. Um... Sorry about the technical <laughs> challenge. Uh, yeah, well, we're all, all set. Uh, and thank you again for having me. Um, I would like to uh, share with all of you uh, some of the, uh, I think personally for the past 10 years, uh, as a practitioner of uh, urban farming, um, the type of collaboration, the challenges that we see uh, and the learning that actually we gain um, through that experience of building a decentralized uh, food regenerative model. Uh, I think just now Sebastian shared a little bit also more about the three types, different type uh, as he shared. Um, I also resonate with uh, what we've learned um, in the city and we do see uh, in, in terms of the different fabric and different type of uh, model uh, that is forming. Uh, there's still a lot of area to explore. Uh, and I think uh, there's much, much more opportunity for us to uh, work together in collaboration uh, in, in, in pushing the frontier. And I think that is also the focus of uh, about today, uh, how to uh, uh, build a future of a sustain sustainable urbanism, uh, which is very much uh, um, and, uh, circling around the lifestyle uh, that is powered by uh, urban farming. I think uh, just maybe you're not familiar with us, uh, we are Rooftop Republic. Uh, and by the name itself, uh, I think it, uh, share with you a little bit of our vision where uh, the Republic is the community and the community actually supports the transform uh, idling or underutilized uh, urban spaces and a lot of them are rooftops um, and engage the community uh, around the story of food. So uh, I won't go too much into uh, the detail or the length of that. Um, basically the simple thing that we do is that we identify uh, such uh, uh, underutilized space in city, we engage the stakeholders. A lot of them could be land developers, property manage management company, shopping mall, residential areas. Uh, we have a conversation with them. We engage the community. We mobilize the community to work together. Uh, but at the same time, we provide a form of decentralized, but yet central, central support uh, as a service. Uh, that's how we, uh, ourselves is an impact venture or social enterprise. Uh, and that is the service model that we apply to sustain uh, in providing the service. So we're also exploring how do we, uh, in the process, develop a localized circular economy uh, around uh, urban farms uh, and also urban spaces. Um, we're a bunch of city boy and girl. 
um, very few of us really grow up in an agricultural background. Uh, and I guess that also make us uh, very much uh, passionate about making city uh, living uh, sustainable and green. Um, and this is the team that we have. Uh, you can see a lot of them are millennial uh, who are passionate and care about uh, the future uh, and the future of the planet. Um, and uh, we do have a, a very simple theory of change where we see uh, the current consumer of food, uh, they are very disconnected uh, because of uh, urbanization or urbanism transformation. Um, we outsource basically the, the entire food uh, to a third party. Uh, this is where we uh, work with different stakeholders, including uh, architects, uh, landscape architects, uh, urban planners, uh, to, to look into how we redesign uh, and make urban farm at firstly accessible. Uh, and then we grow food uh, around those spaces. But most, more importantly is to train a generation. Uh, I think from my generation onwards, it's very disconnected, uh, but, but retrain a generation of community that is able to work on those, far those farms, sustain those farms, uh, and know how to uh, engage uh, and, and carry the, the, in a way, carry the, 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 the baton on. Uh, but more importantly, of course, uh, is to taste and share uh, the, the harvest at the end uh, with the wider community. As a result, it creates positive impact for the environment uh, and everybody, uh, including um, um, the farmers and, and the planet. So um, in short, one sentence, uh, what we're saying what, uh, in, in, in the process that we are, uh, the hypothesis that we're, we're testing and, and, and building is a regenerate, uh, 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 through urban farming, uh, we're building a model that uh, is regenerative to the planet, uh, resilient to the community and, and uh, building resilient for the community. And also and most importantly uh, is rejoicing for our soul. And uh, we, for the past five years, uh, we built about 70 uh, of that or transform 70 of those spaces, uh, engage about uh, 20 over thousand people and uh, act together not significantly high in a way, but to in a like in a very densely uh, 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 dense populated city like Hong Kong, uh, it's really really significant. And most of most often, uh, it is the uh, the iconic uh, uh, importance. It's almost uh, uh, in a way how one building uh, could uh, stretch the imagination of us uh, for future cities as as the world is 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 coming to a rapid urbanization and, and, and that urbanism transformation. Um, so we work very closely with uh, various clients, corporate clients. Uh, they are part of the stakeholder we see, uh, very important. Uh, at the same time as the schools, uh, different NGOs, uh, different private sectors, um, FMBs. So we do see everyone in the society playing a role uh, in building such a, a system. And it's, it's, it could be very autonomous in a way, spontaneous. Uh, but at the same time, how do we uh, organize uh, and, and, and manage uh, projects uh, in, in that sense? Right? That's, that's what we're learning. Uh, and uh, we seek collaboration because we truly believe that this is not something that can be done by Rooftop Republic ourselves uh, and not just Hong Kong. Um, but at the same time, our whole world is facing a resilient crisis right now. Uh, with COVID, with the whole breakdown of the food supply chain. Uh, but at the same time, I think a lot of new conversation is, 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 uh, is, is arising uh, about how we actually need to move from um, just in time uh, efficiency uh, to a lot of just in case uh, with the rapid changes of climate, flooding and all this. How do we ensure communities are able to survive uh, and, and endure? through the difficult times. Um, so that's where we see uh, urban farming uh, through the practice. Uh, there's various benefit in a way. Uh, I won't go into too much because all of you are experts in these areas already um, in terms of uh, the, the rabbit population. Also at the same time, building and cities uh, contribute the most uh, significant carbon uh, in terms of the emission. Uh, but at the same time also, I, uh, uh, 30 to 40% of food that ever produced never, never reached to the end consumer. 
So food waste is a huge issue in all cities. Um, people doesn't really treasure uh, and the issue of ugly food, etc. cetera. Um, but at the same time, the energy use, the energy consumption uh, as well. So um, to the environment, what we see uh, in terms of biodiversity, uh, carbon emission, uh, urban farming do play an important part uh, and role in that. But all, more importantly, what we see is the uh, well-being uh, part where it really uh, provides uh, fresh produce that is really good for our physical health, but at the same time as mental uh, well-being, uh, a very important areas uh, for the quality of life uh, in cities. Um, so um, then needless to say, uh, I think uh, around the globe, uh, different government, various government, whether from a food security point of view, whether from uh, the resilience of the city or uh, just from a pure recreation you know, uh, values. Uh, there's different policy alignment uh, towards urban farming. Uh, and uh, we do see that uh, in Asia as well, uh, quickly catching up and, and moving very fast. Uh, just for Hong Kong, I think, because uh, from Hong Kong, we'd like to share with you all the possibility of the city. Uh, there are 40 over 1,000 buildings uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, and currently, uh, uh, through the research with uh, uh, a landscape uh, professor in Hong Kong U, uh, using satellite, uh, there's 6 million square meter of farmable rooftops. So basically, uh, with sunlight, with necessary condition to grow food on, um, and it's about uh, the equivalent of current uh, farming spaces of Hong Kong. Current farming uh, spaces in Hong Kong is about 7 million square meter. So the potential of uh, just rooftop is 100% increment uh, of, of, of that, uh, of what we are using. And of course, in order for it to make economic uh, sense, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, green building awards. There's many uh, uh, kind of uh, reward or incentives for people to uh, explore. Uh, in terms of new building or existing buildings uh, or city revitalization solutions. Yeah. Um, I won't go into too much on that, but uh, I do want to share uh, about uh, some of the different uh, or how we kind of categorize uh, different rooftops. Uh, uh, of course, there's like general like green roofing uh, where you can put soil directly on it uh, for new buildings uh, during design. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's fantastic for storm service runoff and then increasing storm flooding. Uh, and Thailand as well, uh, with the uh, low uh, sea level, uh, the, uh, how to use it as an urban uh, catchment area. So all these are important issues. And uh, China, of course, uh, with the Henan recent flooding and, 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 uh, uh, and how to create that effective sponge city, right? And, and we see the importance of that as well. Um, and of course, a lot of existing building, they may not be catered with that design aspect, uh, how we can use planters, uh, growing beds, raised beds, um, to uh, effectively uh, address those uh, issues and grow, still grow food. Uh, and we've been doing it uh, for, uh, and most of, in fact, most of our projects are existing buildings uh, and using planter beds. Uh, on commercial buildings. Um, and this is in the shopping mall uh, where you can have that built-in planters as well. It doesn't necessarily have the soil directly on the roof, um, which might cause some damage to the waterproofing membrane. Uh, greenhouses, uh, we would love to have it, um, but sadly in Hong Kong, the regulation is really challenging and with typhoon, um, I think uh, green roof actually make a lot of sense uh, for urban growing and I would, really love to actually learn and also exchange ideas on this uh, to how to uh, even explore. Uh, indoor, not, not, I mean, uh, that's something that uh, this, uh, I think all of you are familiar with this project. Um, but at the same time, I think we are also studying into uh, the energy uh, or carbon emission footprint, uh, which sadly uh, using LED lightings and all this, uh, it makes their carbon footprint uh, almost another 100% higher than farms that you using natural sunlight. So urban farming, decentralized uh, growing food in the community using natural sunlight uh, is really uh, make a lot of sense in terms of ROI, in terms of 
uh, the carbon uh, footprint of the food uh, for production. Um, I would uh, just briefly touch on, uh, I think very important what we learned uh, when we work with our client, when we work with uh, different uh, communities on the farm, uh, is really, really to help them to set the purpose and, and, and objective. This different community in a way uh, is, is very bespoke. Uh, it's almost like a design uh, thinking process, uh, not just the hardware, uh, but the, uh, really understand the fabric in terms of the uh, composition, the demographics, and how the farm could uh, benefit and how to really build the team, train the trainer, um, and, and make sure the farm could uh, operate and sustain. Uh, but something that I would like to highlight uh, and would like to encourage also uh, for future designs, uh, if you are currently designing some buildings or some structure with farms, uh, please, please uh, do uh, look into how you can enhance the food waste in the building uh, and uh, convert them into useful compost uh, and then use them to grow. Uh, as such, it will make so much sense for the building itself. I will share a little bit more uh, towards the ending. But at the same time, uh, some basic facilities we tend to uh, forget because I think uh, a lot of times from the aesthetic point of view, uh, we focus a lot on the plants, on the, on the greenery. Um, but I think at the end of it, uh, for the farms, is, is for humans, right, uh, for us to use. So, for example, accessible to washroom, toilets, storage, um, washing basins, etc. basic facilities, we do see that uh, it's kind of a, a, a easy uh, set aside things by the way, um, but this is our actually primary importance for the success of the farm from a practitioner point of view. <laughs> Hope you don't mind uh, sharing that. Um, but at the same time, you know, uh, the fire safety uh, evacuation, yes, but accessible to electricity increasingly with because of the smart city, you know, um, we do have uh, uh, some farms that we have uh, smart gadgets, IoT sensors, uh, for data uh, collection, for cloud-based capturing. Uh, and I think a lot of uh, uh, farms uh, not necessarily have Wi-Fi uh, access. So these are the, some of the things that I think in the design consideration um, uh, in the learning uh, that we have. Uh, also quickly, some of the projects, uh, this is a residential, uh, very proud that it uh, is award-winning, in fact. Um, and with a young uh, architects that we work together uh, to design. Um, and I think in the process, we, we really, really look into how we can enhance the entire experience of not just growing food for production, uh, but growing the food for education, for the engagement of the, the residents. Um, and, and that's why, uh, uh, how, how do we uh, have the, the teaching area, uh, the experience area, uh, even a bar top uh, so that we can have drinks uh, at the end <laughs> of the day. Uh, and, and other projects that we have is on a shopping mall. Uh, it's about 13,000 square feet. Uh, it's really huge for Hong Kong. Um, and what we did is a lot of education program to the public. We invite neighbor schools to come and visit. Um, we even train uh, retirees uh, living uh, near the community. Uh, to work on the farm. Uh, and there is a hearing impaired schools next door. Uh, and we also having programs with the hearing impaired uh, on that, basically that uh, students um, and, and, and train them uh, on, on farming. So uh, Jockey Club is a, a little bit special. So I think I just include this as a last example. Uh, this is where very like working with F and B, uh, how we grow uh, organic uh, edible plants, herbs, uh, and to serve their clubhouse. Uh, I think these are some of the areas that really, really help to reduce the carbon footprint of the foot mouse because most of the herbs in Hong Kong, at least, fly from all over the world, uh, <laughs> from Spain, from uh, Africa, from basically anywhere but Hong Kong. <laughs> but uh, at the same time, uh, you know, uh, herb is best experience uh, when they're fresh, when they're freshly harvested. Yeah, so this is something that we, we do. Uh, and also combining with some aeroponic, a different type of growing technology. Um, but primarily is a soy-based kind of uh, project that we do, yeah.
So um, with time, I just uh, like to share a little bit more is that uh, we're developing that as a farming as a service. So not necessarily production is our focus, but really how to engage city people in terms of from consultancy design, from building, from managing them, uh, extending the shelf life and story uh, of, of that. Uh, and we truly believe always local, uh, always organic in a way. So we do a lot of soy base, uh, even exploring into in terms of regenerative, because uh, we believe that uh, farms are also uh, very important uh, for the local climate. Uh, and that's why we have like, uh, I mean, I would say develop over the years, a reporting uh, process, the ROI, uh, the experience events, uh, for example. Um, I just like to end off with a little bit uh, of uh, vision or, or sharing of what the future we, we hope to work together with everyone uh, on sustainable food. I think we, we believe in producing and consuming wisely, uh, not just smartly. I think uh, a lot of times uh, we are not wisely chosen and responsibly doing it. Uh, and as we develop uh, urbanization or urbanism, can we do it in a harmonious way in, uh, towards the environment, towards the community? Uh, technology, not necessarily just to replace people, uh, but I think efficiency, but yet how do we do it at the same time we could restore uh, the, the ecosystem? Uh, but at the same time, I think not forgetting whatever we design, whatever we put in, uh, it, it, it should uh, and it have to actively engage and involve the community and the people around so that they, because they are the one who really, really sustain it uh, into the future. Um, so that's just some humble uh, um, sharing uh, for, to, with all of you. Uh, and, and, and that's something that I would like to uh, uh, share, share with you as well. How do, how do we trying to push the frontier in terms of new farms that we built? We just completed this project um, uh, where we will be uh, increasingly pilot and tested it, it, uh, in terms of employing the food waste uh, and applying it in with a smart composter and use it um, for, uh, for the for the garden. Uh, so we so in in future or or in in, in way uh, we believe buildings uh, can be more like uh, behaving like organism, uh, where they can breathe in carbon, they can digest the food waste, and at the same time they can reproduce food uh, to close the loop uh, of the cycle. Uh, and this is uh, borrowed from, from this side, uh, is, is in terms of collaboration. Uh, we are the pro practitioner, a lot of times when we work with uh, architects, designer, uh, they- oh, Sorry, 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 Andrew. I think uh, that you should start to close because yeah, otherwise we don't have the time one. to listen to the others. Yeah, so this is the last one, uh, which I okay. hope to, to, to share with you is that um, when we work with architects and, and other designer, a lot of times when, when they start engaging us, is at a very, very late stage of the project, uh, which actually uh, through, the, through the experience that we, we have learned, there's so much more we can actually do together, to, together and collaborate together in the design so that uh, it can actually be implemented and executed um, um, uh, sustainably uh, for the future. I think with that, uh, thank you very much. Um, feel, you. Looking forward to keep in touch. The next panelist, is uh, Thomas Chung. So Thomas, uh, please uh, feel free to start. Uh, can you see my screen? Towards yes. regenerative uh, ecologies in Hong Kong and Shenzhen. I'm kind of in between Sebastian and Andrew, I guess, uh, uh, at the university doing some kind of projects, uh, but not really a business uh, kind of operation, and but not quite reflecting enough. So I'm, I'm sharing a few projects uh, with you and maybe would like some comments. Uh, I start with, Oh, um, I can't, can I, uh, oops, <clears throat> sorry. I can't seem to, uh, can't seem to kind of advance with my slides. Let, let me try again. Right, okay, yes, you can see it now. Uh, I start with the remote countryside, three projects in Hong Kong and kind of slowly go into the city. Um, and end with two projects in Shenzhen. Um, the, the first three is about maybe the countryside conservation, village re regeneration, reconnecting people to the landscape. 
and then vice versa in the, in the final two. So I start with Hong Kong, new, territor new territories um, and rural regeneration. And I also have a chance to do these projects. And so it's kind of a reflection of the status, you know, the, the, the situation in Hong Kong right now, you know, pandemic and social movement, people go out to the remote countrysides. Um, this is actually Sha Tin, which is, you know, Hong Kong Island is down below and the places where we have in projects now in this Mujilam village is just next to Shenzhen. Um, but, but from Hong Kong, you cannot get there by car. You can only get there by walking or a boat. And there's a series of bays and uh, ports, uh, not just bays and, and villages in mountains or coasts. And, you know, it's kind of uh, abandoned 50 years ago. You know, people from Hong Kong in colonial times went to Europe to find their living or go into the city. Now they go back to the villages to kind of find the roots, but also rem remember their um, agricultural past. But, you know, the, the whole situation has changed. They have a good life in the city, but they still want to go back and claim their properties and, and the villages because they have, you know, it's their, their land, it's their houses. But what, what to do? You know, very remote. Um, the villages themselves actually clear out the clear back out the forest that had enveloped the whole village. But now the, the first terraces have been you know can be seen, um, and and they want to recultivate. But you know in a leisurely way, it's not of course it's not for um, you know a living. They they don't actually stay there. They just go there at weekends. Um, you know it's very remote. But you know this village very small. The leader is very charismatic, and every Every weekend, he leads volunteers and villagers, friends. You know, we we got involved and started to uh, think about you know rebuilding their village uh, and and agriculture and food would play a big part in that. And this is also um, you know supported by the government. So it's uh, government, uh, university, and villagers. You know, trying to do this kind of remote village conservation or revitalization. Then closer to. Uh, the city at the edge, you know, urban rural margins, there are your familiar kind of bottom up uh, uh, non indigenous villages kind of um, occupying land, uh, you know, rented from others. Then when developers come, they have to kind of move, they, they resist, they do urban farming, they are graduates and business schools going back to a you know, place like new territories, very complex in itself, and, you know, living out a resistance that, you know, of course, the kind of uh, hardcore resistance, you know, going to protest doesn't quite work. Uh, so they, they um, you know, do urban farming instead or do a bit of both. And I have two cases, uh, the edge of Hong Kong, sorry, edge of the new territories. One is an actual community farm. They, they resist it, it, it by living through with, uh, you know, by using, the, by doing urban farming and permaculture. But in the end, you know, the developer just, uh, eventually took over. Another case in the same kind of redevelopment area that you can see dotted, uh, that village also you know, very precarious, but they use a way of um, trying to sell their multiple heritages, values, uh, values cultural history, uh, ecology, environment, and somehow the, the planning got rezoned and they are able to survive. You know, although both villages, you know, they don't have any rights really. Um, and I kind of uh, was able to got, get into that with teaching a, a master's studio uh, for a couple of years. So students actually helped, you know, con connect with the villages and we did projects. Uh, we mapped the kind of very, very complex new territories. I think Joshua Bolchova mentioned, you know, these clusters of completely uh, unrelated activities, a back, back garden or back of house for, for the city itself, right? Containers, um, uh, um, landfills, sorry, construction waste and, and all, all that. So we uh, students map these kind of uh, landscape, but also with a lot of interest with villages having their rights, but also villages that come later that don't have rights. And, and these, these village, this village, um, Mashipo, is one where that uh, have no rights. And the student, one of the students, you know, wanted to make a kind of communal space, a communal, um, a co communal cultivation. Uh, a kind of center for these kind of villages that are not quite, you know, the traditional Chinese villages, uh, uh, but but really 
non-indigenous post-war villages that are very fragmented. Um, so, you know, working with landscape type strategies, but of course not quite at the scale of, uh, you know, regional landscape. So these are kind of projects that were proposed um, from a landscape scale to the kind of building scale, temporary, um, you know, waiting to be uh, eventually demolished and by developers. And this is what happens in, in reality. We didn't actually do a project there. Uh, these are the, the farmers, you know, the urban urbanites going back to claim their land um, and showing other people uh, what their land has become uh, at the same time practicing permaculture and doing workshops, markets, and all, you know, you name it, the tours. Um, so that was the kind of resistant village. And the other one called Futeyao is a slightly more compliant, somehow maybe a, a cleverer, intelligent way of somehow selling all the natural cultural history, historical um, parts of the, their village um, to ensure survival, you know, very precarious between uh, uh, Shenzhen and the rest of Hong Kong, you know, lots of infrastructure, slaughterhouses, polluted factories, but within that, they have the ponds, they have their funny history, they have graves, there were ponds that were dug out for making bricks that built the, the Canton Hong Kong Railway that still runs, of course, um, very much uh, advanced. So this kind of village landscape, uh, somehow the villages, um, you know, uh, made a positive kind of um, show of it and it, it got rezoned and now uh, NGOs are working with them, including us to uh, establish cultural heritage trails and even some kind of hostel and kind of um, urban recultivation. So that was, um, you know, in Hong Kong, edge of the city. Um, now, uh, two more examples, uh, slightly kind of uh, a few more years ago, they were experiments that were um, enabled, you know, I was at, had, the, had the opportunity to do in Shenzhen, um, trying to make architecture as pro productive landscape, basically bringing the natural biotic processes back into kind of uh, industrial buildings, you know, a district that needed regenerating, you know, post-industrial Shenzhen, right? Um, I think Marianne O'Donnell was saying, you know, after 30 years, Shenzhen already had to change all of its um, buildings and infrastructure. So Value Farm was the first one that used the idea of quite simply just urban cultivation, right? Um, and the site was a glass factory, one of the earlier, earliest modernizing, you know, icons of, of China in Sheko Shenzhen, the, the open area of the glass factory. This was a part of the Biennale, uh, urbanism Biennale site and uh, uh, curated by Ole Bauman a few years ago. Um, and they, they had their value factory though. So I had the kind of help with the value farm, uh, turning that open area into um, um, an urban farm with plots, uh, pavilions and, and so on. And the idea actually came, it was kind of a, conceptual, um, you know, uh, trick, if you like, inspired by these rooftop farms that people, you know, uh, Andrew made, you know, their operations out of uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, at that moment in Hong Kong, people were thinking, you know, old urban blocks demolished uh, for, of course, high rise towers. But if, it, if not, if those rooftops could somehow be reused, uh, could they be rooftop farms? So I just kind of transplanted the idea. Um, uh, kind of graphically onto Shenzhen, but when it was in back in Shenzhen, it actually worked. Um, you know, the water source for the glass factory, of course, was great for the for the plants. Um, the trees, you know, uh, started to breathe, uh, have uh, you know, enliven themselves. Uh, we brought in Hong Kong students to 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 learn to farm in this kind of weird uh, environment, and it grew uh, very well. And um, yeah, so. It, for the three months of the Biennale, it was quite a, a spectacle at, at that time uh, as a showcase experiment with, you know, um, Lohas festivals. So actually, um, Shenzhen was, of course, very urban as well. Uh, the kids there, they were enjoying it. Um, we, throughout the, the whole Biennale, we had kind of growing, harvesting and tasting events, uh, as well as it, it became a kind of destination for people like, you know, sh shoots, uh, wedding shoots and so on, as well as um, some projection of uh, uh, films. 
Yeah, so that's kind of an architecture as productive landscape, um, of course, curated, uh, but in, in the end, it, it, you know, outlasted the Biennale for about half a year um, before it really, uh, the, the building or the place had to be re uh, regenerated as a kind of, uh, I think, a, a, an innovation startup hub. And the final, I don't know how much time I have. Uh, oh, sorry, before the final project, it just, that Valley Farm project actually inspired me to do something with my, our own uh, school building in Hong Kong. We, we really have a rooftop place. And for a few months, uh, we started this rooftop cultivation that now continues in our, on our roof, um, staff, researchers, and students. The final project uh, works with uh, a similar, similar scenario, uh, another Biennale, another industrial building factory, um, but this time working with uh, water and, and you know, what, what can come with water in terms of producing food and so on. Um, the uh, dormitory building in the factory, we surrounded it uh, with a series of ponds connected uh, with flowing water. And that was inspired, whoops, and sorry, there's, there's a kind of eco water landscape, uh, leisurescape uh, that also produces uh, vegetables and, and fish and duck and so on. Um, it was inspired by the site, which had a kind of water line. Uh, this was the original kind of site. Um, Shenzhen, I think probably now 50 years ago was like this, uh, is the kind of future uh, vision, something kind of in between. So the, the project was inspired by the mulberry dike fish pond kind of poly aquaculture that happens in the Pearl River Delta, but also in the deep bay, these kind of floating rafts. Um, and we, we took this opportunity to actually test out a series of things uh, to do with you know, producing food and, and, and plants and so on uh, through water. And also the cleaning of the different ponds. So you know, from, from a kind of algae, cleaning the water, purifying plants uh, to clean water, being able to grow, um, have fish, duck, and also uh, aquaponics, you know, floating vegetables uh, and fish below. And the, this series of ponds actually worked quite well. And um, it was good to look at for the visitors and people actually were able to kind of uh, taste the, the produce uh, this was actually uh, a test for growing algae, which actually purifies the nutrient-rich water from the other side. Um, so it's, it was also it became a kind of landscape for the uh, part uh, for the kind of parkscape for the Biennale site. I think these are just uh, uh, to show you know what it can, can feel like uh, at the same time producing food and public enjoying this kind of uh, hybrid space events, of course, um, cafes, um, tasting uh, events, and so on, catching fish. Um, so I think this is the kind of uh, bringing back the natural biotic processes into the city. And I think this is it. So yeah, this is just my sharing of a, a range of projects. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you, Thomas. So we follow up with uh, Paul Zimmerman. Paul, please feel free to start at the best convenience. All right, is that is visible? Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, just very briefly, because uh, I see a few people online that probably ha have a bit of a background on, on myself and designing Hong Kong. But I feel so some people that may not have that. So uh, designing Hong Kong has been around now for 20 years. Um, and we, we kind of provoke strategies for urban resilience, um, starting off with the uh, Victoria Harbour, trying to protect the waterfronts of Victoria Harbour, uh, protecting public space in Hong Kong. We, for the last um, uh, decade, worked very hard on saving the country parks from the development pressure. Uh, other campaigns, are more uh, uh, local, like trying to get seats in the city or trying to get footpaths connected. Um, 
fix, trying to uh, stop the destruction of rural land and and uh, these uh, these villages that are trashing the land in uh, in the new territories. Um, we also have uh, quite a number of programs trying to address heritage issues in Hong Kong and um, both uh, living heritage and uh, and structures. Uh, the current program that is running is Walking with Wheels, trying to see if we can get the transport department to recognize uh, people that walk with carts in the city. Um, they're kind of like the city relies on them, but we don't care for them. So we need more caring in our street design for the ones who come around carts. Um, and another program, current program is to uh, make sure we get recycling of our plastic waste, including uh, beverage containers. So this is just a little bit of background um, for where uh, I'm not an academic, uh, I'm an activist uh, and a politician. So these are some of the programs. Uh, the, for the topic for today, um, try to um, highlight uh, a little bit uh, about where we are with Hong Kong um, and I call it the city of three extremes and, and I'll, I'll take you through that. But, We've had a very a fiscal driven policy to limit the land supply in Hong Kong. Um, and that was combined with constraint interaction with, with the mainland. We had one rail line that was built somewhere around 1900 uh, across the boundary. And that was, and then one road link at some stage. Um, but there was, very, there was very little interaction with the mainland. So the city grew up without that uh, traffic going back and forth. and um, uh, but now that as as we evolve um, and we're becoming part of the uh, of the country, we have this one country, two systems. But we we becoming as a city more involved, uh, uh, integrated with the mainland. And the whole issue is now: are we going to open up entirely? Uh, and that's going to be a question that that is going to be upon us. And that one, what will be the impact for Hong Kong if that happens? Um, Hong Kong is, is a city of um, outstanding and unique qualities compared to other cities. And I, I'm, many, I'm sure you all, all have seen these numbers and these comparisons, but I'm, I'm the London School of Art Economics is, is doing fantastic charts uh, to kind of help us see where we stand apart. But um, the, these, these little graphics probably even more so is that enormous is the density um, whereas in London, maybe we're at the peak density, 17,000 people per square kilometers. Um, you know, we're going up New York City and Shanghai, but then in Hong Kong, uh, we're on at the peak, uh, the, the peak um, density is 111,000 um, persons per square kilometers, just below Mumbai, which hits a high in some areas at, at 120. Uh, if we would build, if other countries would be organized to the, the two way that Hong Kong is organized and Albert urban air, uh, uh, urbanized areas are organized, then and this is a chart that I got from Elaine at Hong Kong U. Um, then in and China would do that in the left top in the top corner left. Um, the, the, the dark area would be that urbanized area um, in 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 seven times Shanghai area. In India is the one on the right. Uh, and the United States is, is even more extreme, um, of course. Um, and that's the one on the left bottom corner. If we would be urbanized as Hong Kong has done. But the urbanization is quite interesting though, because these peak areas are a very a, a tight spaces. I mean, you can see the white areas are green and natural and the, these gray and dark areas you see are where we have these, these high densities. Um, and they're specified, the darker the color, the higher the density uh, that you can find in Hong Kong. Possibly even more characterized by this, this map of the walking routes um, and the pedestrian network in Hong Kong, which kind of, again, shows you the distribution of um, where the developments is. And then uh, you can see the mountains. This is looking from um, east to west. Um, you're looking through the harbor there in, in, the, uh, in the right middle um, and Hong Kong Island is on the right side. So uh, don't get lost in the, um, in the fact that I've changed here the direction, but it's a clear indication of, of the topology of, of, of Hong Kong and this enormous density that we have. 
uh, but it's it's uh, located in very narrow areas. So as a result, Hong Kong has a hyper urban density, which is 25% of our city. It, we, we, it's celebrated and I think we're all who live in Hong Kong uh, benefit from this every day, uh, popping out to shopping or eating, meeting your friends or getting to work. Everything is close by and everything is ready at hand everywhere. Um, but then the benefit is also that 40% of our land is unadulterated nature, uh, which we can access from these areas where we live in minutes. Um, um, and that also includes unadulterated beaches and, and blue waters where we can go and swim. Because we have had that land policy, land revenue driven model of trying not to de develop the land too quickly because uh, the British government depended on it for its financing uh, in Hong Kong. Um, they were very careful not to uh, to maximize the use of every square kilometer, uh, every square centimeter of land. Um, and now look what we've been left. Uh, it's fantastic. Of course, we have that. Uh, unfortunately, some of them we got 35% brownfields and villages in Greenbelt, which are um, highly inefficient use. Um, not much agriculture going on in reality. And um, it, it is, it's brownfield. We're in this land is just lying in between waiting for development to the point that, uh, and maybe because of um, the if people are waiting for the opportunity to develop, this is land is so cheap that Hong Kong for long, this area that you see here has been the trading port for waste, waste from Vietnam, Mexico, from New Zealand, from Australia arrives is handled in these areas here and then redistributed um, through uh, various channels to processing plants in China or in other places in Asia. Um, so it's it's like laying idle, waiting for the moment that uh, it's gonna be truly developed. So uh, in the meantime, it looks like this crappy land and crapped over, uh, unfortunately. But that's the three extremes um, of Hong Kong. Um, I believe that this hyperdensity works. Uh, there are, um, I made this presentation in Moscow and uh, where many of the cities and towns are, are trying to increase density, which is uh, controversial with many of the local planners and architects um, because you know putting big towers in, in small towns uh, and cities is, is not necessarily welcome change from where they are today. Um, so when I, put this proposition at hyperdensity works and make this presentation, they were somewhat confused, but for Hong Kong, it really works. Um, we have a very low car ownership uh, and we all use the train. Uh, the road density, the, the, the kilometer length on the bottom, the blue is, is extremely low if you compare it with other cities, um, the, the amount of kilometers or road network per square kilometer. Um, and that is that that is makes it easy to uh, to get around. Then, of course, um, without a car. So the car ownership is very low. Um, you can see here there's a table with something like 77 cars per thousand people, uh, which again makes makes the city very sustainable in, in the way it's operated. I'm sure that um, other cities would be someone would would welcome if the car ownership would go down to that kind of level. Uh, we can operate the city with a very small and short rail network, which again, is very efficient, but again, it's, the, it's because the density, um, most 80% of the people live within a 400 meter radius from a transport node, uh, whether it's a bus station or a, or, a, or, a, or a train station, that comes from being so compact, which makes that uh, easy to live. As we all use public transport, it means also we live healthily because we walk at least 6,880 steps a day. Uh, again, it keeps uh, obesity in Hong Kong is rare uh, compared to South America, North America, many places in Europe where uh, people sit in a car and they sit at home and they sit in the office. Um, and uh, it, it is majorly to do with the fact that we just walk every day as part of our journey to go to work, get our shopping done. Um, which then gives us a very interesting um, 
uh, walkability networks in our city uh, going at many different levels. Um, the um, Hong Kong U did this little graph to kind of trying to explain walkability networks in a small area in uh, in central um, and they did that in this exploded technique so it makes it looks of course very extreme but it is true that we live at many different uh, layers in the city and we walk at many different layers in the city which makes it of course very interesting uh, and a model for probably for other uh, for other cities but it doesn't mean it's it's everybody loves it uh, there's an article here in the Ming Pao magazine calling Hong Kong an unwalkable city because of also the gaps and uh, the elevation changes that are not always comfortable, R route finding that is difficult in, in, a, in a complex network like that uh, because it's, it's developed in so many different forms and shapes by so many different players, it's hard to get around. Um, so it, it, is, it, it is something that needs to be approved and, and it, it is being worked on. What next uh, is the proposition uh, uh, that I want to highlight because I believe that this great city and this great um, uh, way we are structured because of our, our history of as, as, a, as an kind of a, an island next to the mainland, on one side the sea and one side the land that we had limited communication with, what is going to happen next now that we're going to integrate so we're talking about the integration as being part of this mega city region, the uh, the Greater Bay Area, this uh, going up to 80 million uh, people and beyond, and and we were the the purple red line on the bottom there. Um, but when we think about the traffic, um, and I put the the red text on the on the right bottom corner that is current today as we have COVID. And we have very limited traffic across the boundary, about 17,000 vehicles a day. Um, the average in 2016, and, and it has been stable from 20, for about a decade uh, up to COVID, was around 42,000 vehicle trips a day. But as we're getting ready for the future, we've built capacity for 227,000 vehicles a day. What's going to happen when we're going to make good use of that capacity and and everybody's talking about relaxing because of covid and everybody wants to repair the economy because um of uh you know to counter what covid has done so there is an enormous amount of pressure to make good use of the capacity that's built it's never been used it's completely new to the city we have empty bridges empty roads uh, that have never been used before covid but after covid uh, they are going to be opened up and the gap what that means is enormous and the city is not designed for it has never been designed for it um, we also build massive rail capacity which they have used briefly before covid um, uh, and this express rail system um, uh, can carry about 120,000 passengers a day um, and um, and then it reaches out into the into the mainland and can pe bring people in and out. It's laying idle. We've only used it for a very, very short time after it opened, only for a very limited distances. Um, what are we going to do with all of that traffic when we are desperate for the economy to restart and desperate for the world to reopen after COVID? Um, and what is then going to happen to the city that has never had any of this? Um, we've also built a third runway to our airport, which we haven't used yet, um, which is adding on another bulk of capacity uh, for the city that we haven't used yet. Uh, and it is just going to be done and ready and dusted, this, this, this runway, this third runway, when, as, as we speak, um, I, I would, I probably uh, when coinciding with COVID uh, re relaxations becoming real. So what is going to happen to this to the city that is that pretty much looks like this? Um, uh, our very short road network um, is um, is used up, is is used to the max, um, and this is just morning pictures um, as people go to work. Um, we're all going to be back out on the streets uh, more and more as the economy now. 
our 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 days start to look more like these again now that we all start to relax COVID, except that we are keeping our masks on. Um, and the sidewalks start to resemble this kind of feeling again slowly as we all relaxing from COVID and, and we're all going and getting back to work. Um, so the question really is, what is the future for Hong Kong, given that, given our history, given how that has, a, a, uh, you know, how we have formed and shaped our city uh, because of that legacy and uh, for what we can now uh, have in the future in terms of communication and traffic and transport with the Greater Bay and the rest of China uh, and, the, and the world. Um, is our city ready? I don't think so. And I'm afraid of what the consequences could be for some time um, for our city. So I, I put this up there as my presentation for today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Paul. Thank you very much. Um, so maybe I, I would like to, to give a very short reaction to the, the different presentations. Short, so very synthetic. Uh, if I start from, uh, from the last one, uh, thanks very much, um, Paul, for, uh, for this uh, explanation of uh, also from the political perspective of the, the big changes in, uh, in, in Hong Kong. And uh, for sure, I, I cannot resist uh, to the temptation to, to say that it would be fantastic to reflect on uh, this uh, Great Bay area. And because I think when we are speaking, you're speaking of this 40% of uh, unadulterated nature. Um, I think that uh, the, the role of this unadulterated nature is very different if you consider just uh, the question of uh, the relation between Hong Kong and Shenzhen, or if you consider really all the Great Bay area as a, as a new entity and uh, something that, that uh, maybe will uh, produce a different perspective on these 40% of unadulted uh, areas that are in fact a kind of a common space for all this uh, enormous, um, enormous entity. Um, so let's say it's just a, a beginning, but for sure it's extremely, extremely interesting. And I think that this idea of interacting, constructing a new interaction uh, among uh, things that were not thought together I think it's an incredible, challenging uh, theme. Um, also, I would like to thank uh, Thomas for uh, the beautiful presentation. And uh, where, in a way, inside this big scale uh, entities, we, we have the role of design. So that also the small scale design, which uh, I appreciated uh, very much. I mean, this uh, construction of this small spaces, but nevertheless, uh, so, uh, well designed that they become uh, public spaces, they become a uh, space for, for, uh, for sociability. I think that's also a very, very relevant uh, uh, aspect. And also for your attention uh, on uh, the, the villages and these Hakka villages, for example, uh, I think that Gianni in uh, his short presentation at the beginning of the, of the webinars, he, he was touching on this variety of situation that is Hong Kong that we uh, rarely put together, so Hong Kong is uh, also coming back to, uh, to Paul, is, is really a collage of different situations. Yes, there is a big density, but there is so much more than that. You are talking of the 35% of uh, brownfield villages green belt, which I think is a specific question inside the question of the big, uh, of the big area. Um, and then coming to the, to the previous, uh, to the, the, the initial intervention of Andrew. Thank you, Andrew, very, very interesting. Uh, of course, uh, I have some questions about, about this, uh, about uh, the, um, in a way, the, the, the role in the discourse uh, that uh, uh, the, the roof, uh, uh, roof gardens, uh, productive roofs, uh, green roofs, etc., cetera, is, is taking. I see, unfortunately, that uh, this discourse is often used as a kind of legitimation of uh, uh, further urbanization. And uh, so it is, is, uh, is in a way, uh, supporting then uh, approaches that are very opposite and, and, and different. And uh, um, I think that also certain questions related to water consumption, energy consumption uh, should be clarified in a more precise way because uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, there is a cost of uh, bringing water there. Although you can collect some water, but let's say, I imagine that you also have to bring water there to 
use soil that has to be specifically constructed and is not let's say uh, there and and this uh, yeah and this um, aggressive uh, ways to 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 reinterpret the, the green roof as uh, something that give you the, the right to not to continue uh, as uh, as usual and then up to to Sebastian, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, well, of course, I don't agree with <laughs> putting the horizontal metropolis in one uh, small. Uh, um, I mean, in, in small. It's not small. Uh, negotiation, of, of course, negotiation and infiltration are very, are very crucial for uh, any idea uh, of uh, working with the, the existing city. Because here we are looking at the horizontal metropolis as especially as a way to think about what is already there. So in the case of Hong Kong. Uh, this plurality of Hong Kong that are not just the big, uh, not the big uh, concentration, but also uh, all the rest. Uh, but of course, the horizontal metropolis is not only the valor valorization of the existing, but also a place where to test different uh, ways of uh, including agriculture, nature uh, in the urban act realm. So, for to be clear, the secession is also very much. Uh, coherent to what we think could be this space. But uh, I, I accept, of course, your reading, and it is uh, partially in the ambiguity of words and concepts that are never, let's say, fully or uh, uni univocally uh, under under to be understood. But in any case, I think it's, it's, uh, it's always extremely interesting. And I think your the depth of your reading, also of when you bring certain authors, etc., is always extremely is opening a lot of uh, a lot of uh, windows. So in general, I really think it, I, we had a fantastic uh, uh, fantastic panelists, and these are some of my first reactions. And maybe I don't know if uh, Andrea and Gianni wants to integrate or if, or if we accept some questions from the participants, and then we give uh, some moment of uh, let's say uh, reaction to our guest. Yes, perhaps we can listen to the participant and I can eventually, if there is some time, had a comment. Maybe I maybe I, I would, I already asked some, and put some questions inside my first reaction, but yeah. to be more, uh, more, more uh, precise, I uh, would like to ask uh, uh, Paul, is it strange to see an activist that is so positive you know, about uh, the city you're working in? So you look like an enthusiast of, uh, and normally activists are against, you are bringing this, uh, so can you just maybe expand on that? Well, I, I, I live here because I love living here and I, I prefer living here than in any other place. Uh, um, so, um, but I'm, a, I'm an outdoors person, so I fly paragliders, ride my motorbike, go sailing, go hiking, and all of that is just a few minutes from your bed, wherever you are in the city, it's a few minutes from your office. and. Uh, and then when you finish with that, then you can have lunch or shower up in the office and then you do something else uh, and then you can back at work. And there is just no city that works like that. In Holland, you, you have 400 kilometers traffic jam at, in, every day in the morning and in the afternoon it starts at four o'clock. I mean, that's just horrible. You can't get around. Um, in, in San Francisco, I was able to go and fly a paraglider, but you know, you had to get into a car and um, it was all kind of complicated to, uh, to then also go and do other things in the city as well, but that, that probably was was the closest I got somewhere. Um, but so it, it, the Hong Kong configuration as a, as as a city, I think is absolutely unique. Uh, and I must say, when I started designing Hong Kong, I didn't see that as as good as I started to see it once we had started and we started to have these discussions. Overseas, uh, LSE uh, conferences, uh, UN habitat discussions. Um, uh, we went with the Hong Kong government to New York, and then New York came, the, the mayor's city, they came to uh, the mayor and his mayor's office, they came to Hong Kong, and uh, Burton was here. And, um, and so, from these discussions, you learn the strength of the city compared to, the, to other cities in the world. And, um, and Hong Kong performs really well in, on many aspects. Uh, as as a, as a city, and it's people that, in, that live here are not aware necessarily of that as, as as much. And everything in the debate is now overridden by the, the political change in in the city, and that kind of um, makes it hard for people to be positive 
uh, about where we are. COVID has made it difficult. The political change has made it difficult to, to be so positive. But for me, it is still the best city in the world. Um, I'd like I'd like to to ask a question Please. here. Um, I mean, in terms of activists who became uh, very um, fell in love with cities and, and density, um, there is an example um, that uh, really stuns me. It's Stuart Brown. Stuart Brown, I, I don't know if you remember, he was the main figure of the whole Earth catalog uh, back in the 70s, 60s and 70s. And he was advocating at the time for leaving the metropolises, you know, go out in the desert. Uh, they had that sentence on the whole Earth catalog, who was like the reverse of uh, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels thing. They, they said, workers of all countries disperse, right? Leave the metropolises. And then for 30 years after that, he took a completely different uh, 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 view on this. He was basically saying in 2008, in a book called Whole Earth Discipline, he said, the problems we are facing are so big, uh, climate change and everything, that we can only um, um, uh, uh, um, deal with them with super concentrated uh, 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 response, right? And so he basically said, density and concentration are the solution, right? Uh, for population, you know, uh, population growth, huge and very dense cities. People will make uh, less children, uh, even, you know, and that. So Problems of food, GMOs. Problems of energy, nuclear. Uh, I mean, this is exact, and, and if that's not enough, uh, then geoengineering, right? I'm, I must say, I'm a bit surprised <laughs> by, by this, because what is the cost of concentration? Of course, yeah. it's nice you walk uh, in hyper-dense uh, cities. I live in Paris, which is quite dense also, and I walk a lot, and it's good for health. But what is the cost? Uh, uh, of that uh, hyperdensity there? What is the basin that is tapped into to make this uh, 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 possible? This is a huge question uh, uh, for me. I don't question the fact that it's nice to be in those kinds of hubs, uh, right, where everything is accessible and not far. But I'm really, really, really uh, concerned by uh, the cost in terms of energy, in terms of supply, in terms of colonization of lands uh, here and there, not necessarily next to Hong Kong, but uh, uh, further. Um, I'm super concerned. This is for me, uh, in a way, exactly uh, the tale uh, that I described first, which is incorporation. Right? Everything that can sustain that kind of life has to be highly capitalistic, right? Uh, has as a consequence, huge monocultures uh, 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 here and there. In terms of transportation, it's uh, a, a mess. Um, I'm really concerned by, to see that kind of discourse embraced uh, uh, by activists. Thank you, Sebastian. That's very interesting <laughs> reply. Uh, I don't know if we immediately go back to Paul. Maybe I would like uh, also Andrew, that uh, I was a little bit also accusing of <laughs> legitimizing other uh, uh, non-sustainable uh, use of <laughs> choice by, by oh, working. Paula, on... Paula, you, you raise a great point. Um, I think uh, just uh, like to bring uh, in maybe a little bit of different perspective and maybe it would be helpful for all of us to, to continue the conversation and, and, and thinking. Uh, bringing down to three points in view of time, uh, I will not go into too much technicality uh, in terms of how to make this can be very, very sustainable. I think the, the one key, uh, very important thing that growing up in cities, growing up in Hong Kong myself, um, 
is the feeling of um, helplessness. It's the feeling of lack, no choices in a way. Uh, we are trapped in this shoebox size uh, residence houses. And in fact, uh, it is a luxury to be in the shoebox houses. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's like you have to basically pay the price of all your whole life to work in order to be in one of those shoebox houses. So I think the key is how the, 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 the conversation or the, the, the thinking that we like to bring in with urban farming as a mean, not the end, as a mean to drive the, the rethink that we actually could live differently, uh, even trapped in the city, and also allow the grassroots people to say, can we better utilize the space? At the same time, we engage designer when they look into future city, future landscape. When we incorporate nature, when we re-invite nature back, can we not just do it like a green coating? I think green coating, I'm, I'm sorry to say, um, probably is the easiest and most convenient way to do it in, in practice. But what we see is it doesn't really get rooted into the community and be able to transform the lifestyle. Ultimately, what we're looking is how to be in the cities in the center of the city, engage those uh, conversation, transform within from that city and bring people back into the interest of nature again. Through experiencing of growing food, be interest with nature, be aware of the climate change, be aware of the change of a whole uh, bigger ecology and biodiversity challenges. I think that is the, the uh, what we see the greatest, greatest value in this. Uh, but of course, in the process is how to do it uh, sustainably, right? And, and grow uh, together with the rest of the city. Right. So this is a shorter version. I would uh, love to engage in a longer conversation as well with you. Uh, thank you so much for the question and, and, and yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, th that was also a, a point of curiosity I had. Uh, because uh, um, again, coming back to this uh, enthusiast <laughs> activist, um, I, I'm thinking to the, some of the people I know in Hong Kong and the, the, the small uh, uh, surfaces, small houses to live in the apartment that is really you know, reaching some extreme of, <laughs> of um, um, say, a, a possibility to, to exist inside the space. And, uh, and I was thinking, how was the impact uh, of, uh, of COVID, for example, in, uh, in, this, in this situation, how people could, uh, could uh, survive, let's say, in, uh, in such a small apartment and how, how was it this period? This has nothing to do exactly with the, with the theme we are looking at, but nevertheless, I think it's one of the elements of, uh, I think, uh, not, funda no, not high resilience of this uh, hyper congested, hyper-concentrated uh, city that, uh, that is Hong Kong. Uh, I have to say that uh, I'm also in love with Hong Kong. Of course, no, no one, I think, uh, is not in love with Hong Kong because Hong Kong is, is a special, is an, is an exception, is something that, uh, and I think that Hong Kong cannot be uh, put as, as a model. I think uh, Sebastian will say this, of course, we all love Hong Kong, but uh, we don't think, uh, we also, we all love Venice, but uh, probably we are not remaking exactly another Venice because there is uh, something that is really extreme in those cities. And uh, I was just curious maybe from your experience also to understand how COVID was uh, a, a moment of rediscussion of this uh, very specific way of living into, in, in Hong Kong with the shortness, the, the dimension of, of housing. I don't know if Thomas, uh, then yeah, maybe Thomas. Maybe, and... maybe I can okay. say something, yeah, because uh, I think uh, uh, the way I can see it and even personally um, affected by, by the COVID and the pandemic is that we, uh, you know, we, we uh, have to go out to, let's say, the countryside more. Uh, more and more, I, I know people like Paul already enjoys the countryside and the city, but maybe the younger generations, you know, playing with the mobiles, um, more and more, even uh, people like them 
uh, going to, to hiking, going out to not just experience, physically experience that landscape, but also to, uh, I think it's part of a bigger movement of Hong Kongers, you know, finding their self-identity, you know, knowing more about their land, basically. Yeah. And um, the country parks, the, the unadulterated natural landscape contains also, you know, lots of uh, ecologies and histories uh, and, and, you know, some of the uh, countryside remote village pro projects I'm working on, um, you know, yeah. actually allows me to, to know more about the, the histories of, you know, how Hong Kong or, or mainly the, the edges of, you know, rural Hong Kong, um, you know, uh, outside of the, the hyper urban centers, how th those areas were shaped and their, their histories, the cultures, and so that it's, it's enriched, uh, I think, um, our understanding of Hong Kong as a place. Of course, we have that yeah. global international kind of, uh, um, you know, capitalist core, but there are these rich um, areas. And maybe just to, uh, I don't have the solution to, you know, Sebastian's question about, um, you know, do we have to have density and concentration? But I think uh, people in Hong Kong also are aware. For example, some of the people who advocate uh, urban cultivation or even, you know, um, in increasing farming back to the 50 years ago when I think the self-sufficiency of Hong Kong was quite high, you know, 80%, we can rely on ourselves. Uh, those people would say, actually, we have, we buy veg, of course, from uh, lots of, you know, other countries, but we even have um, areas in Northern China, uh, which are, you know, very dry climate, kind of growing veg, especially, you know, destined for export to Hong Kong, very high energy, um, because Hong Kong is like that particular pak choy or something like that. So there, we are aware of that. And, and so I think it's part of that awareness, you know, larger awareness. We, we like our high, hyper density, but, you know, uh, how do we yeah, deal with that um, is, is one of the ways to really go out and, you know, also know our own countryside a, a little bit better. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, there is Lu no, that wants to. Uh... Yes. Yes, we have a question from Lu Shui Wen. Hi, hi, I'm Shewan. I'm a Dr. Telemanis PhD student. And I have a question actually about urban farming and uh, to control the flooding. So earlier, um, you guys mentioned there's possibly there's a solution that using the green roofs to kind of combine those two function together. But um, actually, I have two sub questions about that. One is for urban farming, usually in this climate area, it should be three seasons. And what about the last season in the winter? How do you manage the surface? And the second is like usually for green rooftop, the amount of soil is kind of like limited. So uh, in a way, it, it's um, to my understanding, it's pretty much depending on the engineering kind of uh, solution to, to do rainwater management. So what, what's your solution in like real life projects? Mm, maybe um, I would start first and uh, maybe Thomas can also uh, uh, supplement on, on, on and, and, and bring in different perspectives. Um, I think the example that we uh, highlight and I was uh, sharing, uh, one is uh, actually in Thailand. And I think we know that, uh, I mean, I know the architect personally uh, herself. Uh, and I even went to visit uh, some of the projects uh, when I traveled to Thailand. Um, so they, they do, I mean, they, they are Thailand and um, like Netherlands uh, is, is very much uh, issues with that because they are under sea level. Uh, flooding and, and, and a phenomenon like this is very common in urban areas as well. Um, I think when we look into uh, urban farming, not necessarily we're talking about um, a building on top of building, um, but I think the key spirit uh, here is that uh, previously, I mean, uh, I'm a civil engineer, so previously I was uh, at the asset management, right? When we, when we develop a project, uh, we remove a huge part of nature 
and then we start pouring concrete into that space. However, um, the concrete, as we all know, will basically, if we, we, we put concrete in, in terms of uh, everywhere in our city, right? It will create a huge stress in terms of our catchment area and then the service runoff facilities, which require a huge energy and they cannot handle uh, a huge flood or huge uh, uh, occasion like this. Um, what we are saying uh, or, or what I believe is that when we do the next development, when we are looking into pouring concrete into nature again, let's put in our design, let's make sure that we can work out a system, whether it's engineering, whether it's uh, coupling with uh, soy, uh, it, a comprehensive, like we think ecosystem, in, and, and treat it like a live organism such that we can place capability of such that cities can consume some part of it. And the soil, uh, although may not be uh, huge in, in, in a way of uh, little planters, um, but they are sometimes occupying almost 50 to 60% of that roof space. Uh, and, and that helped to slow down uh, that area of the water running into the uh, uh, rainwater dump pipe and into the central system. Imagine that is only a rooftop of let's say 500 square feet to 1,000 square feet. But when we do it as a community, as a zone, uh, as a city itself, that capability or that potential uh, is something that uh, uh, could be significant as well. Yeah. yeah, just I will just in view of time, uh, stop here. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, if um, there are no other questions, or maybe Andrea and uh, Gianni, you, you did not. Yeah, uh... <laughs> yeah uh, I, I would like to, to, to add something on this uh, discussion, and which I found very, very much exciting. Uh, to me, what seems to emerge. Uh, at the end of the webinar is, um, uh, uh, if you want an expansion of the understanding of agri agriculture as a synergic uh, capital, uh, which uh, uh, somehow is expanding its uh, societal value beyond, uh, if you want, a common identification of agriculture as a productivity, I mean, exclusively as a productivity or beyond the discourse on pastoralism, if you want more in a, a Western part of the world or cuteness here of the crops. Uh, if we use the categories of Sien and Guy uh, about cuteness. And, um, and I think uh, connecting this production productivity to what Paul said, and this capacity, what is emerging is that we still into a, this uh, understanding of the territory between one end and Newtonian or mechanistic approach, which uh, manufactionalize the crops, the agriculture, uh, without creating a, a life cycle. And another one is control of the space through every infrastructure. So I think that uh, uh, from what Sebastian has presented, Thomas, Andrew, and, and Paul, uh, agriculture seems to be a very core, core center to engage a society more around uh, several, several connecting values. That's my, my, my comment. And uh, very shortly, I think, for example, if we imagine the role of permaculture in designing the landscape, you know, the way that we associate the landscape, rural landscape, for example, through agriculture, permaculture can, can really recentralize somehow the role of landscape architecture by creating this kind of productive garden through the association of, of different plants. So uh, the value of agriculture is really, is really strong in this sense. That's a really a design tool, a thinking tool, and, and so on. This is my, my point of view. Thanks. Gianni, if you want to. I have a question for all of you, but maybe uh, to Sebastian, but also to Paola, if you want, and uh, Paul as well. Uh, I really like the debate that was rising up from, from this uh, session about concentration and, and, and dispersion, diffusion, and a different kind of model. And it seems to my mind, one of the most famous writing actually on that debate or probably the one that started that debate that with Paola we have been discussing uh, for, many, uh, for many times, which is uh, the work of uh, uh, Francois Fenelon, uh, The um, Adventures of Telemachus. 
and uh, and all this debate that was rising uh, in the 60s in Italy about concentration, because concentration is not just concentration of people, it's also concentration of wealth, it's also concentration of resources. And uh, what is happening in Hong Kong to me and in, in the Greater Bay Area, for different kinds of reasons, one is COVID uh, for sure, but also due to this big vision that is put forward by the government under this idea of the Greater Bay Area is a sort of redistribution and reabsorption of resources. And uh, they're in a way um, redistribution to a larger, um, a larger uh, territory and uh, with a added value to uh, places that we, as Thomas was mentioning before, we didn't even consider some years ago because they were considered to be remote, backwards and, and, and rural. And but nowadays, due to many different reasons, but particularly to, uh, to COVID, we somehow rediscovered. So I believe that Hong Kong, uh, at least my perspective, is a, an extreme case. And being an extreme case is also, in a way, a revelatory case uh, of what is happening worldwide and a sort of redistribution from these centralities to a larger territory. Uh, what is your perspective of this on, on the work of Fenelong and, and, and what is happening at the moment? So Sebastian, maybe, or Paul, or Paola. Sebastian, Sebastian, has something yeah, to say. Uh, yeah. um, uh, unfortunately, I can't engage with Fenlon uh, <laughs> because I don't know exactly what you're uh, referring to. Um, uh, yes, but it's um, uh, during the COVID crisis in, in, in this part of, uh, of the world, um, we've seen um, a, a lot of people that would certainly uh, previously define themselves as, as strong urbanites, uh, taking uh, a, a kind of shift uh, during those past uh, months. Uh, it's incredible to see uh, the value that was added uh, in real estate in, 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 in the countryside, uh, at least in France, uh, uh, recently. And um, a number of people who are uh, uh, starting to uh, consider that they might live in other uh, places than the metropolises, right? Um, so it's interesting to see. I'm not sure where, it's, where it, uh, it will end. Uh, I'm not sure it's not a way for wealth to uh, put its hand on the countryside. Uh, uh, also, or whether it will uh, truly lead to um, more autonomous way of uh, of organizing, uh, uh, you know, uh, and become uh, at least more um, uh, relatively independent, uh, based on a kind of, of control of food production, a kind of Kropotkin. Uh, <laughs> Uh, idea, uh, you know, secession. Thank you, thank you, Sebastian. Maybe I, I try to say something. I'm not very structured, but um, I think for for the case of Hong Kong, um, probably uh, maybe Paul can Paul knows much more. Um, in in terms of coming years and decades, the, the areas that are most prone or kind of, uh, to development are those, let's say in the, in the new territories, the new development areas already planned and some kind of going ahead. And that that's that area, I think Paula also mentioned this, uh, the space between Shenzhen and Hong Kong, and it's all across the border, ac across the whole border, the different uh, bits of, of new kind of connections uh, and so on, and and I think that the, the government also is uh, looking into that. I think recently I've heard you know the uh, uh, kind of ex director of planning you know is kind of being called back to to work on uh, the redevelopment or future development of this border zone. Um, and I guess the the other area would be in the margins, like like the Lantau, uh, the the bigger islands, of course, um, you know the reclamation. Uh, idea. Um, so th that's kind of for Hong Kong, I guess, you know, th those are um, possible, you know, chances, opportunities 
Um, can we do something other than uh, the, the big new towns that uh, we've been you know, having or, um, recently in recent decades? Or are there um, more ways of kind of dealing with the, the land um, other than just you know, uh, housing and, and, and countryside? Um, I don't know. And then for the, the kind of remote countrysides, um, again, it's a kind of observation that I've, I've become, sorry, begun to know more about the kind of hilly, very hilly uh, valleys and bays that around, let's say, the north and eastern part of Hong Kong. And maybe, uh, you know, uh, actually in, in the past, uh, you know, when it was in the 60s, 70s, or just before, uh, a, lo a lot of that was cultivated because people, the, the villages there, you know, people just survive. They, they have to make all of the terraces uh, are cultivated. Of course, they left and now a lot of that has become country parks, but still within those areas, a lot of privately owned land and, and the villages, you know, a lot of them are, uh, the, their descendants are abroad in Europe, uh, but it, it's kind of latent uh, what, what can be done with, with those areas, um, especially ones, um, you know, close to Shenzhen, because looking over, um, you know, the Shenzhen border, places like Chateau Kok, um, you know, um, people were discussing, you know, uh, if it opens up a, a bit more then the, the mainland, a lot of, you know, uh, de investment development might happen along the northern new territories, even. So I, I yeah, just kind of more of an observation. So is it like we can have a kind of range of what Sebastian um, kind of suggested incorporation right in the center, um, but negotiation and infiltration like at the edges, maybe some pockets of very remote um, countryside. We can have secessions even, but very at, at a very small scale. Um, at least in the village scale, you know, uh, those villages I work with, they, they cultivate their own stuff um, and bring them back to the city. Um, yeah. I think there was uh, something uh, interesting what uh, <clears throat> Sebastian said at a certain moment that uh, this association doesn't mean uh, it's not inevitably somewhere outside uh, remotely, you know, that you can have your secession also in the city. And this, I think, is, is, very, is very interesting. I would pref I prefer to interpret uh, the, the three, let's say, the three paradigms uh, in this sense that there is a possibility of choosing, of choosing if you want to to be self-sufficient, if you want to work more collectively, if you if you are um, trusting some elements of technology, you want to test some of them. I think that this uh, freedom is something that uh, is not immediately uh, constructing a specific uh, space. In fact, uh, the, the images, Sebastian, you, you showed are, as you said, a little bit caricatural, but we are not imagining a so linear relation between uh, those position and, and the type of space. So in, uh, in Hong Kong, uh, I think it would be very interesting to him to work on the idea of self-sufficiency at the scale of one skyscraper, as maybe Andrew is imagining that the roof can really be able to to, to support uh, the entire the entire skyscraper. I don't know. In, in any case, it's it's extremely um, challenging and and interesting. And from my perspective, I'm especially uh, interested in the gray area, and also in this 35 percent that is not the very the very consolidated uh, skyscraper city is not the remote, uh, natural, fantastic reach of heritage. In the middle, there is something that is a little bit unknown. And I think that there, the, the questions that uh, Gianni was, uh, was putting are especially relevant because I imagine that on, the, uh, on this uh, nature, uh, there is already a certain awareness and, and pressure a pressure to maintain it and to and to make of this really this um, uh, big uh, uh, megalopolitan park, let's say, you know, uh, on the on the very uh, on the very dense part, uh, as uh, you were saying, it's it's already working. I mean, it's uh, always remaining the idea that this this is really an exceptional case. It's not something you can replicate uh, in other places. It seems to me very very difficult because the story of Hong Kong is a very special also history and it will be very 
strange to reimagine exactly the same uh, the same model uh, somewhere else. But then there is this um, part in the mid where you there is the question of redistribution, the question of accessibility, the question of bringing the same qualities. I think becomes become really relevant and also political in, in that sense. So again, I think it's very, very useful what, what has been discussed here and uh, useful to, to imagine, to imagine uh, Hong Kong. And from what I understand, this new Hong Kong uh, is in need of a new vision. Not only because of COVID, not only because of politics, because of climate change, because of everything, but in any case, in this moment, Hong Kong is really revising itself, maybe with this new awareness of, uh, of a territory, of a territorial scale, let's say, of, of, of Hong Kong. Um, Paula, uh, if I may, I, I really love, love your comment. Uh, and, it, and in fact, I believe that it's not just Hong Kong. Um, I think the, the rest of the world, the cities, um, there's a lot of city dwellers. Uh, uh, it's, it's basically a, a new awakening and a rethink. Uh, yeah. And and I'm I'm totally with you. Is that um, think through urban farming, through practicing organic growing, I learned so much about nature. As such, that I believe cities in future need to uh, again. Uh, it's not about sky skyscrapers uh, only. It needs to be develop as an ecosystem, a holistic way of, of, of growing uh, and, mm -hmm. and developing. Uh, I think the challenge with Hong Kong now, um, practically or in, in reality, uh, through the experience I, I, I've seen, uh, helping, mentoring uh, new young designers, um, there is a fear about nature. It's because mm -hmm. we, this generation, do not grow up with them. Uh, we are lack of the understanding and knowledge. And, and I think for, for us with the vision of, of the future sustainable city, uh, we need to raise and groom this generation of new uh, visionaries who, 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 who embrace uh, nature instead of fearing them. <laughs> So, so I think Thank that's, you. Thank that's you. a few practical steps that uh, I hope, you know, I believe with, with all of us collaborating, uh, yeah. we're, we're there, we're, we're, we're on the way there. Okay, I think it's a, it's a very nice way to conclude, uh, Gianni and Andrea, if you, if you agree, yeah. uh, with this idea that uh, you have to go back uh, walking into the, this territory, and maybe uh, Paul can, uh, can be the guide <laughs> to bring... Uh, <laughs> Someone. Well, no, I, I, I first want to go to Paris and meet up with Sebastian and drink a bottle of wine and have a good discussion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's Thank hope you. to see in any case each other maybe in, uh, in Hong Kong in, in the future. And uh, thank you very much to everyone. And um, that's the second webinar. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Paola. Thank and you see again. you next thank week. You. Thank you all. Thank you. Lovely meeting all of you. Thank you.